In the name of the one who was and is and is to come. Amen. Amen. Keep awake, urges Jesus. Be ready. Paul in Romans says, it is time for you to wake from sleep. Jesus and Paul wouldn't be urging the disciples to stay awake if they weren't nodding off. The early church was preoccupied with the timing of the second coming and being ready for it. Paul elsewhere, for example, in 1 Thessalonians, talks about what is commonly called the rapture. The early church was, as we know, wrong about the timing of the second coming happening within a generation. Some scholars have even gone so far as to describe Jesus as a failed apocalyptic. And what they mean by this is one who expected to inaugurate the kingdom of God on earth himself in his own life and death and was wrong. And yet I wonder, was he entirely wrong? Jesus uses the image, after all, of a thief for God's coming, or a flood coming unexpectedly. And we might say, picking up on the image of a thief, that God has, in Christ, already done a break-in to this world, stealing, stealing death and despair in Jesus' resurrection. Yet today's message, keep awake, is essential at all times and in all places. In every age, Christians fight a battle against inertia, fatigue, and indifference. And if in the first couple of generations after Christ's resurrection, how much more so now, 2,000 years later? Sam Wells, in his book, Face to Face, warns against the sacrament of our own exhaustion. He's talking specifically to clergy, but his words apply to everyone, I think, every one of us who is a baptized Christian. What Wells means is giving ourselves to the point of having nothing left, a profound spiritual and emotional fatigue. I think many of us can recognize that desert. When we look out searching for something to be hopeful about, and we find nothing. There are many paths to this emptiness, this desert of mind, body, spiritual fatigue. After all, we live in a time when the planet itself, the life of the planet, is in balance. There is the dull depression that settles on us after the latest mass shooting, Colorado Springs, Chesapeake, Virginia, the Bronx, there is the depletion of giving everything to the demands of our work or the needs of family and friends or a worthy project, only to find that after all that, the situation hasn't changed. We may be exhausted from feeling that everything depends upon us in our little world. That is a great temptation, and Jesus faced it in the wilderness. A lot did depend on Jesus, but even so, Jesus was able to recognize it as a temptation. Man does not live by bread alone, not by human effort alone, but by a greater power, every word that comes from God. The temptation is relying on human effort alone, and that does indeed wear us down. Jesus' great weapon in the desert and everywhere else is keeping his focus on God and what God says. That is what Jesus continues to teach us about being ready. The flip side, after all, is that if we can be caught unprepared, we can also be caught prepared. And this matters now as much as 2,000 years ago because Jesus came to save souls, or if we prefer, to rescue souls. A friend of mine used to work in finance on Wall Street. He worked in the bastions of corporate finance, finding it after a while a little empty. Despite his tremendous success, 
materially. On his lunch hour, he started going to Trinity Wall Street for their noonday mass. It saved my soul, he says. Bit by bit, lunchtime by lunchtime, he was nourished, mind, body, and spirit. That person is the reason that we offer a noonday mass. That is the reason this church is open every day for prayer. This is a community where we are prepared to welcome souls that seek a life beyond serving themselves alone. What Jesus rescues us from, saves us from, at minimum, is from the hell of being the center of our own universe, saves us from everything that destroys us from within when we don't succeed in the way we want. Jesus saves us for a different life with God, for loving relationship with God and our neighbors. Trinity Wall Street saved my soul, said my friend. What he meant by that was not the glories of the building. The church is first the people and only second the building. Because of this, it is our turn now as the people of God in the Holy Spirit to continue Jesus' work by living in such a way that through us, Jesus can still rescue souls. This is why it matters that we are ready. Paul names some of the everyday choices that we can make that are foundational to living prepared. Let us lay aside the works of darkness. Let us live as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness. Paul's letter was written around 57 AD. It's early, within the first generation after Christ's resurrection. And it was written to a specific Christian community in a specific city, Rome, with a very particular culture. Paul urges believers to opt out of Roman cultural norms that are destroying them. Cultural norms like excessive drinking and casual attitudes towards relationships. Christians need courage to be countercultural in how we treat others and how we treat ourselves. How can we draw closer to God if we are not in our right minds? Paul essentially urges us to honor the image of God in us. He urges us not to do things that make us less than we are created to be. I wonder what unhealthy cultural norms might we need to opt out of? After the 8 a.m. service this morning, and I was giving a very brief homily with a couple of these points, someone at the door said, oh, the cultural norm that my family needs to opt out of is putting down their iPhones. She said they're at the dinner table, and instead of making eye contact with each other, they're constantly on their phones. It occurs to me that God is often the one sitting across the table from us trying to make eye contact with us as we are checking our texts. Paul then moves on to graduate level living prepared. Not in quarreling and jealousy. I hear this as an imitation of Christ in the desert. Paul urges us to keep the focus on God as Jesus did, not what others are saying or doing, or not saying, or not doing. Make no provision for the flesh. This doesn't simply mean avoid too much carousing, because life is more fun if you don't wake up with a hangover every morning and don't destroy your relationships. The flesh, for Paul, is shorthand for the old creation. All that is BC, before Christ, all that destroys us from within all that makes us less than we are, less than the image of God in us. We know what those things are for us. We all face those inner struggles. They are universal in some form. And Paul suggests that we can set aside, that we can bit by bit turn from those works of darkness and live in the light of Christ. What is the most important thing in this busy season, lots to do, 
Lots of shopping and preparations and decorations. But what is the most important thing? I think quite simply, it is drawing closer to God. That is our central task and focus this Advent. Is there a way that we can move through our daily tasks and our busyness and the cares that claim us, a way that we can move through those that keeps us close to God? Can we go about our Advent days with Jesus on our hearts? Sometimes I find that a hymn, because I so love hymns, I find that a line from a hymn from the Sunday worship travels about with me in the week. It becomes a soundtrack. Sometimes it's a line from a prayer or the Nicene Creed. Is it an earworm? Or is it an invitation from the Holy Spirit to draw closer to God? If we are not sure where to start, we might take a look at the very last verses of Scripture in the book of Revelation. Come, Lord Jesus. Advent words at the end of the book of Revelation. Perhaps we can carry those Advent words with us this week on our lips and in our hearts. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen.